Well, hello, it's good afternoon for me. Uh, this is Tech for Senior, or Tech for Seniors for March 6th, 2023. This is episode 153. We've got three more uh, episodes and we will put to, uh, put to rest our uh, first three years. I'm Huey Poplock and I'll be your host today. Uh, Ron is uh, in the back seat, uh, kind of uh, enjoying himself today. Uh, this is a one-hour show about technology with uh, Q&A at the end. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about security, SD cards, and a cool website called uh, Photophonia. And then uh, Notepad goes tabbed, and Chat GPT is a desktop app. I uh, want to introduce uh, our uh, our people, uh, other than me. Uh, we are on every week on Mondays, uh, depending upon what time zone you're in. And don't forget this uh, this Saturday night, except in Arizona, the time zones change. And so we uh, this is spring ahead, so turn your clocks ahead. So next Monday, uh, if you're an hour off, uh, that's probably the reason you forgot to change your clock. But the clocks and the computers do it automatically for the most part. Anyway, we're glad you're here. Uh, uh, even though he is the co-host today, I want to introduce you to uh, my uh, co-host uh, today. Uh, he's at, as far away as I, he can be from me. Uh, he's in Vancouver, British Columbia and Comox, and I'm in Bradenton, Florida. Ron, uh, you've got a couple of things you want to tell some people, right? Or tell the people. Hold on, I was just out shoveling snow, so I'm I was a little bit late joining the uh, joining the show today. So uh, those of you in Oregon, we're sending it down there. <laughs> anyway, um, yes, the premier service today is going to be uh, a big one. I'm going to be talking about Amazon Warehouse and saving you money. And many of you that saw the show a year ago that I did on that um, have emailed, like Steve emailed me and said. This is crazy good. This is this is saving me lots of money. So you'll want to watch that. Uh, Bill James is going to tell us all about virtual desktops. And Huey, who reads terms of service? I mean, you did. Uh, anyway, Huey's going to tell you all about how to get the best out of terms of service. So it's a good one. This is a good premiere, uh, premiere video. I'll put the link in the, in the show notes. Uh, for the best YouTube channel, uh, for my YouTube pick, uh, this last, uh, on the Saturday newsletter, uh, we had uh, of the Android Police, which is a great, uh, great channel. Uh, they started uh, in 2010 with 400, and they have now 400,000 followers. And if you look at their body of work, they get, they've had over 87 million views. So it is a major channel on YouTube to keep up with Android um, information. And they have a great review on the Samsung S23. So it's a great channel. Um, if you are interested in Android, then I would encourage you to, um, to watch that, uh, that channel. Uh, I also, uh, speaking of our Saturday newsletter, you'll find out that, of course, we had uh, some very, very nice donations last week. Uh, we had, uh, uh, the, and we want to thank the following people, Ann Titus, uh, Michael Swift, and uh, Keith Murphy, thank you so much for your very generous donation. Uh, if you did miss donating uh, to Tech for Senior, as we um, we need to pay the bills, I'll put the link in uh, in the uh, in the chat, and you can uh, certainly help us along. But thank you so much for those donations. Uh, back to Huey. All right, uh, thank you, and don't forget our newsletter uh, comes out twice a week. You need to be signed up for it, and if you haven't signed up for it. Go to our website uh, at www.techforsenior.com and uh, the information will be there and you can sign up for our newsletter. Uh, please do so. There's some really good articles in it every week and it's things that we don't, a lot of times don't cover here on the show. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, from uh, 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 New Mexico, Bob G or Bob Gesticia. Uh, Bob, uh, say hello to everybody. If you unmute yourself, you're muted, Bob. 
It's springtime. We're going to hit almost 70 degrees here. I was able to go out this morning without my jacket. So things are looking up. Well, that's good. You're still you're probably still going to get some cold weather, though, right? It's too early. Uh, <laughs> there's always hope. <laughs> yeah. uh, and Bill James is with us uh, from Oklahoma. Hi, Bill. Good morning. It's 56 degrees. And I'm using my Chromebook today to uh, view the program. Yeah, Bill. Bill's a, a Chromebook person, a Windows person, and a now a Mac person. So uh, how, how are you coming with the Mac? Doing pretty good. Working uh, on it. I, I did the I did the e I did my e bulletin yesterday on it, and um, I'm getting accustomed to. Uh, there's some minor differences, but I'm finding that. Uh, uh, a lot of the operating systems work quite similar. Yep, it just uh, sometimes a different key or a different keystroke or uh, things are in keyboard. a different place. But yeah, and different keyboards. Yes, uh, I I've been kind of looking for a used uh, Mac that I'd like to just kind of play with. I don't want to spend a lot of money on it. I don't want a new one, uh, and I don't have anybody that's going to give me one. I don't think so. Uh, <laughs> that's how sooner, I sooner. Sooner or later, yeah, you had her, yours and not in a way we would like to have one, but I'm sure you were uh, happy with it. Uh, it was a uh, uh, somebody uh, passed away and uh, and it went on to you. And also, finally, he joined us is Ray Baxter, our music man. Good morning. Good morning, you. Yes, better late than never, as the expression goes. And uh you talk about the 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 if we have spring coming, you know. Remember the old expression: "Marsh comes in like a lion, goes out like a lamb." Well, it's still coming in. So, although today <laughs> we, we do have a beautiful day here, but uh, it's been a lot of snow this year. Yep. Okay. Yeah, you muted me too. <laughs> I'm. But anyway, we're, we're glad you're here, Ray, and you made it. And uh, uh, we'll have uh, Ray do his music uh, at the end. So right now, uh, I want to turn it over to uh, uh, to uh, Bob G. And uh, Bob, you've got uh, your uh, uh, weekly report for us. Here is the Avast Security News Roundup for the week ending March 3rd, 2023. Black Lotus becomes first UEFI bootkit malware to bypass Secure Boot on Windows 11. A stealthy unified extensible firmware interface, UEFI bootkit was called Black Lotus, has become the first public known malware capable of bypassing secure boot defenses, making it a potent threat in the cyber landscape. This boot kit can run even on fully up-to-date Windows 11 system with UEFI Secure Boot enabled, Slovak cybersecurity company ESET said in a report shared with the Hacker News. UEFI boot kits are deployed in the system firmware and allow full control over the operating system boot process, thereby making it possible to disable OS-level security mechanisms and deploy arbitrary payloads during startup with high privileges. Read more at the Hacker News. Here's another update on the LastPass breach. Keylogger installed on employee's home computer. In Monday's update, opens in a new window, LastPass added that only four developer ops engineers at the company possess the necessary decryption keys through a highly restricted set of shared folders. However, the hacker circumvented the company's security safeguards by serving malware to one of the developer ops engineers at their home. This was accomplished by targeting the developer ops engineering home computer and exploiting a vulnerable third-party media software package, which enabled remote code execution capability and allowed the threat actor to implant keylogger malware, LastPass said. 
The malware then recorded the keystrokes on the engineer's computer, enabling the hacker to capture the master password for the employee's password vault at last pass. The same malware appeared to have helped the hacker bypass the multi-factor authentication on the account, which contained the decryption keys required to access LastPass cloud backup system. Read more at PCMag. Asking Bing Chat to be more creative will decrease its accuracy. Microsoft is attempting to balance what it apparently sees as Bing's core function, a co-pilot for the web. It's never been quite clear what that entirely entails, but initially it seemed like Microsoft intended Bing Chat to be a tool to supplement its traditional search engine, summarizing results pulled from a variety of sites to save users the need to dig for those results on their own. Some of the more creative elements, such as the ability to tell stories and write poems, were apparently seen as bonuses. If you want to use Bing Chat in its role as a search assistant, select the precise option. If you value more creativity and don't care so much whether the topics Bing brings up are totally accurate, select the creative option. Perhaps in the future, the twain shall meet. Read more at PC World. Your voice can be a password, but are you protecting it like one? Biometric authentication should be treated with the same considerations as other forms of account or device protection. In this context, biometric data is a set of physical passwords, and like any password, if the information is accessible or otherwise insecure, your security is weakened. Your voice can be recorded. Your face can be photographed. Your fingerprints can be used while you're incapacitated. You don't need to stop using these methods of safeguarding your privacy, but their very convenience means they're weaker forms of defense. Think of them as the equivalent of short passwords. While they'll deter some people, someone can bypass them more easily. Read more at PC World. U.S. Cybersecurity Agency raises alarm over Royal Ransomware's deadly capabilities. The CISA has released a new advisory about Royal Ransomware, which emerged in the threat landscape last year. After gaining access to victims' networks, Royal actors disable antivirus software and exfiltrate large amounts of data before ultimately deploying the ransomware and encrypting the system. CISA said. The custom ransomware program, which has targeted U.S. and international organizations since September 2022, is believed to have evolved from earlier iterations that were dubbed Xeon. As of February 2023, Royal Ransomware is capable of targeting both Windows and Linux environments. It has been linked to 19 attacks in the month of January 2023 alone putting it behind Lockbit, Alf V, and Vice Society. Read more at the Hacker News. New flaw in TPM2 library poses threat to billions of IoT and enterprise devices. A pair of serious security defects has been disclosed in the Trusted Platform Module, TPM 2.0, reference library specifications that could potentially lead to information disclosure or privilege escalation. These vulnerabilities can be triggered from user mode applications by sending malicious commands to a TPM 2.0 whose firmware is based on an affected TCG reference implementation. The Trusted Computing Group, TCG, said in an advisory, large tech vendors, organizations, using enterprise computers, servers, IoT devices, and embedded systems that include a TPM can be impacted by the flaws. Quark's lab noted, adding they could affect billions of devices. Read more at the Hacker News. This update malware strikes again with Linux version. 
The threat actor known as Lucky Mouse has developed a Linux version of a malware toolkit called SysUpdate, expanding on its ability to target devices running the operating system. Cybersecurity company Trend Micro said it's observed the equivalent Windows variant in June 2022, nearly one month after the command and control infrastructure was set up. Over the past two years, campaigns orchestrated by the threat group have embraced supply chain compromises of legitimate apps like Able Desktop and Mimi Chat to obtain remote access to compromised systems. Read more at The Hacker News. This week's must read on the Avast blog. Read Avast's top article on how to safely file your taxes online while making you aware of the risks and the steps to take to protect yourself from cyber criminals. Read more at the link listed. Did you know? Here are some important dates for March. March 10th, 1876, first successful phone call. March 12th, 1989, the World Wide Web is born. March 15, 1985, first internet domain registered, symbolics.com. March 21, 2006, first tweet posted. March 24, 2001, Apple introduces Mac OS X. March 25, 1995, the first wiki premieres called wiki wiki web just thought you might want to know and that wraps up another week of the avast security news roundup stay safe stay secure and i'll see you again next week bye bye the bad guys don't take any time off do they never do they just they keep finding ways to get around anything that we do uh right. you know and, and and a Keeps friend of mine busy. once, yeah. And and a friend of mine once said, uh, "Locks and doors that are locked only keep honest people honest." And uh, uh, it's it's too bad, but uh, we have a good thing going, and and then there's those bad guys that make it so we have to spend a lot of time and effort to keep them out. So let's. Uh, Go to the next thing. Uh, now, uh, a month ago when I was the host, I was all set and I started to play uh, one of the videos uh, that I'm going to play now. And all of a sudden, I lost everything and I didn't get back on. So we're giving you a chance to see what you missed a month ago today. So let's uh, go here and we'll try. Let's see this one first. What you need to know about SD cards, I'm Huey Poplock. An SD card is a small, portable memory storage device used in digital devices such as cameras, smartphones, tablets, and more. It provides a convenient way to store and transfer data such as photos, videos, music, documents, and other files. SD cards come in various sizes and capacities, and they use flash memory technology to store data. They are compatible with a wide range of devices and can be easily removed and replaced. SD cards are also available in different types, such as SD, SDHC, and SDXC, each with a different capacity limit. Additionally, SD cards can be protected by a password or encrypted for increased security. An SD card, short for Secure Digital Card, is a type of small, portable memory card that is commonly used in digital cameras, smartphones, and other electronic devices to store data such as photos, videos, music, and documents. SD cards are available in a variety of capacities ranging from a few gigabytes to several terabytes. They are also available in different physical sizes, included standard SD, mini SD, and micro SD. SD cards use flash memory technology, which, is, which allows them to retain data even when the power is turned off. They also have built-in security features to protect against unauthorized access and data corruption.
SD cards are the most common memory card type used in digital cameras. Having been around for more than 20 years, this type of camera memory card is readily available, relatively cheap, and capable of performing well enough in cameras designated for beginners right through to professional users. There are several factors to consider when comparing SD cards, including capacity, speed, and durability. By capacity, that refers to the amount of storage space on the card, measured in gigabytes. Higher capacity cards can store more data, but they also tend to be more expensive. Speed is another important factor to consider. SD cards have different speed class ratings, such as Class 4 or Class 10 which indicate the minimum write speed of the card. A higher speed class rating means the card can write data faster, which is important for things like recording high definition video. Durability is another important consideration. SD cards can be susceptible to damage from water, heat, and other environmental factors. Some cards are designed to be more durable than others with features like waterproofing and shock resistance. Overall, the choice of SD card will depend on the specific needs of the user. If you need a higher capacity, fast and durable card, you may want to consider a high-end SD card with a high-speed class rating and durability features. Here are the various values on an SD card. The speed of an SD card is determined by a number of factors, including the technology used in the card, the capacity of the card, and the SD card speed class. The SD card speed class is a rating system that indicates the minimum guaranteed write speed of the card. The speed classes are 2, 4, 6, and 10. UHS-1 speed class 1. UHS-1 Speed Class 3, and UHS-2 Speed Class 1 and 3. The read speed of an SD card is usually much faster than the write speed. A card with a high read speed would be good for transferring large files quickly, while a card with a high write speed would be good for recording video or taking a lot of photos in quick succession. Although the physical size and shape of the SD card have not changed since its launch in 1999, the format internal specifications have gone through several iterations. Flash memory technology has also evolved, delivering improved reliability and significantly increased speeds. The improvements are welcome, but it has created a problem. The continuous evolution of SD card standards has given birth to a host of symbols and classes used to describe the type of SD card and its speed. It's not uncommon to find an SD card marked with six or seven different symbols, making it difficult for people to understand precisely what they are buying. I'm trying to demystify these symbols and ensure you know what you're buying and whether it's suitable for your camera or whatever device you're using. Some memory card manufacturers quote SD card speed in megabytes per second, while others, such as Lexar, prefer to quote a speed factor like 1000x. This is confusing for the consumer because it makes it harder to compare SD card speeds between the two brands. The speed factor naming scheme is a hangover from the days of CD-ROM drives, where the standard drive read CDs at 150 kilobytes per second. Therefore, 1x is equal to 150 kilobytes per second and 1000x is equal to 150 megabytes per second. Isn't that ridiculous? In an era where some photographers are of an age where they won't even know what a CD-ROM drive is, a few brands use their speed to gauge modern flash memory speeds. This idiotic practice of quoting SD card speeds based on speeds of CD-ROM drives appears to have stopped 
with the advent of CF Express cards. An SD card class is simply a way to define the minimum continuous write speed of the card. This is not a maximum peak speed, but an actual minimum continuous write speed that any device, camera or not, can count on having available with any SD card. This minimum continuous write speed is critical because if your camera shoots 4K or 8K video, you need to use a card at the very least delivers a minimum continuous write speed fast enough to record those formats. The complication is that the SD Card Association has changed how they represent sustained minimum write speed three times. They started calling cards Class 2, Class 6, or Class 10, by which they meant that they were capable of a minimum sustained write speed of, of 2 megabytes per second, 6 megabytes per second, or 10 megabytes per second. Then they decided that this was too many letters to write on the SD card, so they changed it to use the USD card class standard, and things took the form of a U1 and U3. In these examples, U1 corresponds to a minimum sustained speed of 10 megabytes per second, and U3 is 30 megabytes per second. Essentially, divide by 10 and stick a U in front of it. While I agree that writing U1 on a card is easier than writing class 10, both have the same 10 megabytes per second specification, the problem is that SD card manufacturers just started to put them both on the card. In their eyes, the more symbols on a card equals better. Unfortunately, it even gets dumber because we now see the card manufacturers putting completely extraneous symbols on SD cards. For example, they all carry the C10 Class 10 symbol and the U3 symbol. U3 guarantees a minimum write speed of 30 megabytes per second, and the C10 guarantees 10 megabytes per second. Naturally, you cannot reach U3 standards without it also delivering C10 standards. It's common sense. But card manufacturers insist on adding the extra symbol for fear that a competitor's card might look better if it were to carry the symbol whether their card did not. If you thought this couldn't get worse, you're wrong. <coughs> to confuse the issue even more, the U standard was swapped for the V standard. Now we have V30, V60, and V90 SD cards that guarantee a minimum sustained write speeds, you guessed it, 30 megabytes per second, 60 megabytes per second, and 90 megabytes per second. And sure enough, these symbols are stuck onto the cards alongside all of the other ones. The result is a cluttered mess that, conf that is confusing for consumers. So let's simplify things. Here's a chart that helps you. If a card carries a V30, a V60, or V90 symbol, this is the only speed-related symbol you need to pay attention to. All of the U-classes and Class 10 nonsense are meaningless. Any card with a V30, a V60, or a V90 class will automatically pass all of the other SD card class standards below it. These days, following this simple guide will allow you to determine the relative speeds of 95% of the SD cards on the market. And it's more likely the manufacturer of your camera will have specified a minimum write speed in the manual or online specifications of either V30, V60, or V90. Another SD card performance indicator is whether the card uses the UHS, the Ultra High Speed Bus, 1 or 2 configuration. The UHS 1 cards are limited to a theoretical maximum speed of 104 megabytes per second and are cheaper to manufacture. The UHS 2 SD cards are faster and theoretically capable of reaching speeds of up to 312 megabytes per second. 
and the uh, you'll see the example the UHS-1 card is on the left and the UHS-2 card is on the right. There are two ways to distinguish between the UHS-1 and UHS-2 SD cards. Firstly, the card will either have and or all marked on the front. Usually the symbol will be marked alongside the type of SD card. For example, it might say SDHC2 or SDXC1. Secondly, unlike the other SD card performance difference differentiators, such as U or V speed glass, there is also a physical difference between the UH1 and UH2. Looking at the back of the SD card, a UH1 card will have a single row of metal contacts, whereas a UHS2 card will have two rows. Let's go back one slide to see that, so you can visualize that. And here is a chart of the UHS speed classes for SD cards and their minimum write speeds. These are minimum speeds and actual performance can vary depending upon factors such as a specific card and the device it's being used in. Also keep in mind that the UHS-2 cards are backward compatible with the UHS-1 devices, but they will operate at the lower UHS-1 speeds and require a UHS-2 compatible device to take advantage of their higher speeds. There is a certain amount of backward compatibility between the UHS-1 and UHS-2. You can use either card type in any camera or SD card reader that accepts an SD card. The critical thing to understand is that both the devices and the SD card must be UHS-2 compatible if you want to unlock the additional speed benefits of the UHS-2 interface. If you put a faster and more expensive UHS-2 SD card into a camera or card reader that is only rated for UHS-1, the card will be limited to the UHS-1 speed of 104 megabytes per second. Or if you use a cheaper UHS-1 SD card in a more expensive UHS-2 card reader, your photos will still download at the slower speed delivered by UHS-1. If your camera is only rated to UHS-1, you might not see the in-camera speed benefits of buying a more expensive UHS-2 SD card. However, it may be a worthwhile investment if you want to speed up your image ingestion and editing workflow. After a long day of shooting to a high-capacity SD card, such as 128 gigabytes, 256 gigabytes, or even 512 gigabytes, having a UHS-2 card and card reader still save you upwards of 20 to 30 minutes of downloading time. Another point of confusion that often arises while discussing or researching memory card or hard drive speeds is the bits and bytes. Capital M, capital B per second means megabytes per second. M, capital M, small b, slash s, means megabits per second. Sometimes these are also written as capital M, capital B, P, S, and capital M, small b, P, S, to confuse things even further. The SD, SDHC, SDXC, and SDUC, and their sizes. As you can see in the last slide, from a consumer standpoint, the primary difference between SD, SDHC, SDXC, and SDUC cards is the potential capacity. Although we call all of these cards SD cards, it's scarce to see an SD card on the market anymore. Technically, they died out more than a decade ago. Most of the time, you see SDHC cards if it has a capacity below 64 gigabytes or SDXC cards if they have a capacity above 64 gigabytes. As for SDUC, although the standard exists, you probably have never seen one for sale, so it's safe to ignore that type of SD card.
for now. Plain old SD cards aren't sold anymore, and you are likely not to see an SDUC card either, which means that the most which means that most cameras that have been built since 2010, and indeed all cameras made since around 2015, have SD card slots that'll work just fine with the two types of SD cards you'll find in the store shelves, SDHC and SDXC. In the end, out of all the little symbols that are stamped on an SD card, this one perhaps is the least important. Just get the SD card capacity that's right for you and double check that your camera will support it. The answer will then be yes for 99.9% .9 of you. Micro SD cards are much smaller than SD cards, but you can use them in place of an SD card when combined with a micro SD to SD card adapter. These adapters look like regular SD card, but they have a tiny slot in them which you can insert the micro SD card. These adapters are cheap and readily available at most electronics retailers. In some cases, they're included with the micro SD card. Here's the identifying pieces uh, of the SD card. Here is the speed classes, the UHS speed class, and the recommended speeds. Here's, a, here's some of my SD cards. And I have an SD card holder that holds both the micro SD card and a regular size SD card or their adapters. This, these are SD card readers in a computer. They could be a micro SD card or a regular SD card. This is an SD card reader if you don't have an SD slot in your computer. So, this has been What You Need to Know About SD Cards. I'm Huey Poplock. More information you'd ever thought you'd ever hear about an SD card. It's confusing, but in the long run, it's there's only a few things you need to know. So, uh, uh, if you need to go back and, and revisit this, uh, please do so. Uh, feel free to, because there's so much information about SD cards that we never knew. Okay, the next thing that I want to talk about is, let me go ahead and share my screen. Website of the week, number 18. I'm Huey Poplock. Photofunia. Photofunia is a cloud-based photo editing tool that gives you a fun-filled experience. Take any photo and just wait to see the magic. Their proprietary technology automatically identifies the face in the photo and lets you add cool photo effects and create funny face photo montages. Photofunia is free and is very easy to use. Just select an effect that you like from over 650 effects, select your photo, and Photofunia will handle the rest for you. Let's take a look on how to do it. This is Photofunia. There are lots of effects that you can choose from. A word of warning, however, on the website, there are lots of ads. Be careful what you click on. Some of them want to go. Besides the website, they do have some apps for iOS, Android, Windows, and Ubuntu Linux, but I prefer and recommend you use just the website. Let's take a look. Let's try a couple of examples. First of all, let's do billboards. Then we're going to go to popular, and then we're going to come down here, and let's, let's choose New York City billboards. Now you can choose the photos that you want to use. I have over on the side, I've already chosen several pictures, so that's where they're going to come from. I'm going to choose photo one, Ron Master one, and bring it over. We're going to crop it right there. We're going to go to choose photo two, bring that one in. Move it over a little bit, crop it. Choose photo three, file. 
and we're not going to do any cropping for it but we're going to leave it just that size and then at this point I'm going to click on the orange go and that quickly we have our finished product and you click download it's here and if I open it and that's what it's going to look like let's try another example let's go to celebrities you can see there's lots of them there and we're going to choose the Polaroid dress we're going to choose a photo take this one bring it in we're going to crop it down a little bit and tell it to go there's our finished product and we hit download and this is what it looks like from our computer and that is photophonia a lot of fun to play with nothing nothing uh, earth shattering but uh, certainly something that uh, uh, you can make some interesting pictures and share and 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 post and so on uh, Huey, next, I, Huey, I always told, said you, told you we'd get our name in lights. And, absolutely. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> on Times Square. <laughs> Times Square in New York. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Okay. And I've got one more that I want to uh, uh, show. And it's it's about Notepad uh, uh, coming out with a tabbed version. And the only problem, and I didn't mention this in there because I didn't discover, I somebody asked and I tried to find out the answer. It doesn't appear that it's going to work it with Notepad and Windows 10. It's only going to be a Windows 11, at least in the beginning. And it's not on every machine. You right now you have to down you have to purposely download the update to uh, to Windows 11 in order to get the tabbed Notepad. But let's take a look. Not only am I going to talk about the note uh, the tabbed information, but what it actually what notepad is in case you don't use it or know about it notepad goes tabbed introducing the latest enhancements i'm huey poplock microsoft has released a new version of the windows notepad with a new tabbed interface allowing you to open multiple text files within one window with the new tabbed interface, Microsoft has made Notepad a powerful tool that includes almost everything a regular user would need from a text editor. Notepad looks like this, you know, with the title bar at the top and then a menu bar at the text area and then at the bottom is the status bar. Now, we're going to compare the old menus with the new menus of Notepad. Here is the old one. You can see because of the tab, there is some additional items in the file menu. Now let's look at the edit menu. Again, we see some differences. The main difference is at the bottom is the font. The font formerly was on the format and now it's on the edit and there is no more format choice. This is what the format had was word wrap and font. Now we've already seen the font. But now if we go to the view, we'll see they've added the word wrap to that menu to eliminate one of the menu items. Also, the help menu is no longer there. It is now uh, part of the settings and the help is at the bottom. You have some additional settings that you can do right from the settings uh, gear. If you want to open Notepad, you can do it from the search button at the bottom or you can use your start menu or if you prefer you can actually add it to your taskbar like I have right here at the bottom with one click can open up notepad Microsoft notepad is a simple text editor software that comes pre-installed with all versions of Microsoft Windows it's a basic tool used for creating and editing text files such as configuration files, HTML code, plain text documents. Notepad is an easy to use program that does not require any special skills or training to operate, making it a popular choice for beginners. 
The Microsoft Notepad is a simple text editor that comes pre-installed on Windows operating systems. It allows users to create and edit plain text files, including notes, code snippets, and other text-based content. Notepad is lightweight and is fast, making it a useful tool for quick note-taking and editing. Some of the basic features of Notepad include the ability to change the font and the font size, search for and replace text, and view and edit text files in different formats, including Unicode, UTF-8, and ANSI. Notepad also supports line and column numbering, as well as word wrap, which automatically wraps long lines of text so that they fit within the window. While Notepad is a very basic text editor and lacks many of the advanced features found in more powerful text editors, its simplicity makes it a popular choice for many users who need to quickly create and edit plain text files without the need for more advanced functionality. So let's use Notepad. I have a website that I wish to copy some of the information that's there, but I don't need a lot of the extras. I don't need the links and so on. So let's just highlight what I want to grab and we'll come down to right here. And I'm going to then copy it. And then we're going to open up a file that we already have in Notepad. We're going to date stamp it. So we're going to put the time and the date, which is right now. Then I'm going to move down a couple of lines. Now I'm going to say paste it. And there is everything from that article that I highlighted stripped of all of its formatting. And there are times you want to do that. This was one. And this is how I use it most of the time. Then you can go back in and you can edit some things out of here that you don't need that were headlines or possibly a uh, caption under a, a picture that you didn't want. Here's something we don't need again. And all of this. And then there was a bio of the article's author. And I can save it. What I can also do with this new version is I can have a tab. And so I can put something else in here and say uh, reminders. And then I can add to this later and so on. So I can now save that. And it saved it to reminders.txt. And it's telling me where it's going to go. I am going to say, OK, reminders right there. And it saved it. Now, the other thing that I can do with the tabbed items is I can actually drag it off. And it's now a separate file. So I can move it to my other screen. I can close the first one down and leave this open, whatever I want to do. And if I should want to return it to the tab, I can just move it here, and it becomes a tab again. Notepad has been updated with a Windows 11 style design and dark mode support. It now supports tabs so you can view multiple notes in a single window. The new Notepad includes several standard rich edit editing enhancements such as Alt and X for re-entering Unicode characters, Control plus the right bracket for toggling between matching brackets and parentheses, multi-level undo, which is a great advancement, drag and drop, color emoji, and auto URL detection. This has been Notepad Ghost Tabbed, introducing the latest enhancements. I'm Huey Poplock. It's a, a big advancement, and uh, if you don't use Notepad, I find it very handy just to chat, uh, uh, jot just uh, simple notes down and then just save it. And uh, sometimes if I want to, then I can copy and paste it into a Word document, or if, like I showed you, as far as a, a website, grab everything, make it all text, and then move it into, let's say, Word, and then I can highlight my own things. I can take away the different colorings that they have for uh, different words or parts of sentences and so on. It just makes it easy to uh, uh, convert it. With that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Bob G, and he's going to talk about some chat GPT. 
So, Bob, go ahead. If you already have access to the new Bing search with ChatGPT, did you know that you can put ChatGPT on your desktop as a web app? Let me show you how that's done. Start by going to Bing.com, and it's easiest if you do this in the Edge browser. And once this opens up, select Chat. Once this is open, Click on the three dot menu, select apps, and then install this site as an app. Bing AI search. No, let's call this chat GPT. Now let's minimize this. The apps, as you can see, the app's been installed, and I have several choices. I can pin it to the taskbar. I can pin it to the start. I can create a desktop shortcut. And I can also have this thing start automatically when I log into my device. What I will do is pin it to the taskbar and pin it to the start. Select Allow. I'll close this out. Now, let me close this. I had selected to pin this to the taskbar. And if you look at the taskbar, this new icon, and as I said, I called this chat GPT. So if we now select that new chat GPT that we pinned to the taskbar, you'll notice it's now opening up as a web app right on your desktop. And this would be the same as if you went to ChatGPT's OpenAI website. This is exactly what you'll see when you get there. The advantage here is that you can also switch over to the Bing search with ChatGPT enabled in that Bing search. As I stated earlier, you must already have been accepted for this new feature from Bing. If not, You'll have to wait until you've been accepted once you've gotten onto the waiting list. But this is one way to get that feature directly on your desktop as a desktop app. Stay safe, stay secure. I hope that helps. Thanks, Bob. I followed your video. I had it in one area of my screen and I followed it. And I was able to set it up and, and, and make it work. And it's great. Thank you so much for that. Uh, at nice this time. It's, it's nice time, to know it sometimes works. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, although the, the first time I clicked on it, uh, it didn't open. What I had to do was take it off the uh, taskbar and then put it back on the taskbar. And then it worked fine uh, for whatever reason that it, it just uh, didn't start. But it works great. At this time, we're going to uh, end our uh, YouTube uh, group. So those of you who are on YouTube, if you want to uh, uh, hear the music section and would like to uh, uh, be, be a part of the Q&A, uh, there's plenty of room. You can join the Zoom meeting. If not, we'll see you next week or at least uh, later this week uh, for uh, Tech for Senior Live. And again, thank you for uh, uh, joining us on YouTube. Thank you so much, Yui. Appreciate that. Let me share my screen and get it going here with today. We're going to have something interesting. It's going to be all about Elton John. And Elton John is going on his final tour. And this is really a tribute to his legendary career. So it's called the Farewell Yellow Brick Road Tour. And it's named after Elton John's 1973 album, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. And that features some of his most iconic songs. The tour consists of more than, listen to this, 300 concerts worldwide and is intended to showcase 
his final in-person appearances. Within an hour of the tickets going on sale, the first 60 shows were sold out. Now, the first concert was held in Allentown, Pennsylvania on September 8, 2018, and has continued throughout all regions of the world, including the U.S. and Canada. Mm-hmm. The last show in North America was held at Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles, where John first performed a historic concert in 1975. That's more than 47 years ago. The tour will begin its final stages later this month in Oceania and Europe with the final concert date scheduled for July 2023. Now, John has said he decided to retire from touring to spend more time with his family and focus on other projects. He also expressed his gratitude to his loyal fans for their support and love over the years. The Farewell Yellow Brick Road Tour is a once in a lifetime opportunity to witness one of the greatest performers of all time bid farewell to his fans with a spectacular show that celebrates his legacy in music. Unfortunately, only a small percentage of his fans will be able to view this spectacle in person. But thanks to today's technology, YouTube has the entire two hour and 30 minute concert from Dodger Stadium free to watch. I have edited the video, of course, to to show just his final song at the concert and the audience reaction. I I always get a kick out of looking at the audience and seeing people that weren't even born when the songs come out singing along. Another great uh, piece, uh, musical piece from Ray. Thank you so much, Ray. And uh, uh, at this point, we're going to go on to our uh, Q&A section. Uh, But before we do, I want to have a few announcements. Uh, uh, Don't forget this Thursday is the Tech for Senior Live. Uh, It's not on uh, Zoom. It is on Facebook and on YouTube. And to get uh, uh, where the channels are and so on, you can go to uh, www.techforsenior.com and all that information is there. Uh, this Sunday is the CFCS Windows uh, and, and STUG uh, Sarasota Technology User Group and the Central Florida Group. Uh, the Windows SIG is this Sunday, and information about that is either on the Tech for Senior website or at Huey.net. Uh, what else we got going on, uh, Ron? Anything you can think of? Uh, no, except Tap for Senior Live uh, this Thursday. Will, excuse me, we'll be on uh, uh, four alternatives to your cable uh, cable modem. So uh, for internet, uh, so you might want to uh, uh, listen in. And we have the new four new four four important features for you to think about. And we'll be talking about that on Thursday. Uh, other than that, um, great show, great show, Huey. Thanks for doing it. Uh, I'll be I'll be back next week though. Remember, oh yeah. When you're still <laughs> here, you can answer some questions too. Okay. Uh, uh, I do want to remind people that uh, uh, the uh, uh, you're free to do the Q and A Q&A now, but also we post a lot of articles on the uh, Tech for Senior Facebook page, and if you're not following that, you really should because there's some very interesting articles. We do get to some of them on Thursdays, but we don't get to all of them. And there's also a channel for learning Chromebooks for those of you who like to follow Chromebooks. So at this point, uh, if you want to put up your hand, uh, if we can do some questions or comments, Ron, you're first. Uh, I just wanted to let you know, Mike Ungerman put in the chat and a very important issue. Um, He uh, went to the... the, um, the website you talked about in website of the week for the pictures and put typed in um, the wrong URL and, and immediately got a, um, and, and got a scam site. Right. Uh, so be careful, be very, very, very careful. Uh, um, you, you need to look at Huey's video and, and, uh, and, and put exactly as you said, because if you type something different, Mike's already put it in the chat. I don't want to repeat it, but if you type something different, you could be in a really bad situation. And there's a lot of ads in there too that have different colored buttons. You want to make sure you hit the right button because I did. it did take me to, as soon as I clicked on a button, it popped up and, and I got a warning from my antivirus program. 
So you need to be careful what you click on, but you should at any website you go to anyway. Uh, Die Bender, uh, you have your hand up. Hi, um, two quick questions. Uh, Bill mentioned working on the Mac. Is he gonna have a class or did he have a newsletter or something? Um, Ron, can I answer this? I think uh, there's a plan that we're going to do a little segment on Max and okay. a future uh, tech for seniors. I just want to yeah. make sure I wasn't missing something. No, Diane, that's right. We've always wanted to have some sort of uh, Mac input to, we don't want it just to be a PC, a PC show, right? And right. so this is a really big missing part of the show. And Bill has graciously um, agreed to help us with that. And he does, of course, win those tips, but he's he's a man of many talents, right? So <laughs> he's going to, we, we hope to have that coming up. And you can, if you keep, a, I'm sure you've subscribed to our newsletter. Uh, oh, yeah. And so please, please, we'll keep, we'll keep you posted in that. And okay. uh, we might even have a Mac section in the newsletter where we're, we're working on that. And um we really, re really want to work on that hard this year. That's a major goal for us. But we just need to find some help because none of us have Max, right? <laughs> so we yeah, have well, to... I do, and yeah, I, yeah, I, I took a class. I don't use it like I should, um, but um, anyway, I was just curious. And the Notepad on Huey um, is that just eleven? Did I miss that? Yeah, uh, it appears to be. I I try to do some checking, and I can't see any mention that uh, it's going to be for Windows 10. But it may yeah. be later on. But in the right. in the beginning, at least, it's it's just going to be Windows 11. And right now, not everybody has it. Uh, and the uh, the update you have to go to the Windows update uh, page in Windows and specify you want to install uh, to run the this latest update. It will not automatically uh, uh, download to you. Oh, okay. Thank you all very much. Okay, Dorothy, you have your um, hand up next. Uh, thanks, Huey, for the great presentation on SD cards. I didn't know what all those numbers were on all the cards that I've got. Oh, I know. Um, it's so confusing. <laughs> yeah, I, I ran into an interesting problem. Uh, I went on vacation, and what I normally do is I download my Netflix shows and smart downloads to my SD card and I've never had a problem. It worked fine on January 11th and sometime between January 11th and February 12th when I was returning, um, whenever you click on Netflix, it opens and shuts. So I took out the SD card, I uninstalled Netflix, I just troubleshot like crazy and it will only do it to internal storage. So on websites, it looks like they're saying it's something to do with Android 13, however, and Netflix. However, the tablet doesn't have Android 13, and it always worked up until February 12th. So just wondering if anyone's had the same issue. Uh, I'm not aware of any. Uh, I do know that uh, I had an SD card in, in, in a pocket and went through the laundry and when it came back out and it dried off, I put it in and it worked. Uh, but there's no guarantee yeah. that's going to happen. It works fine on the Chromebook to download yeah. to the SD card and watch offline without Wi-Fi, but not on a Samsung tablet. And they mm. say it's Netflix has to fix it or something. So, okay, thanks. Gary, you have your hand up next. Ah, uh, yes. Uh... First of all, I want to thank you for that SD uh, card show as well. Uh, I'm one of those that's confused, and uh, it was very helpful. But uh, yesterday morning when I uh, brought my laptop up, uh, I have McAfee, and I had a, this pop-up says, stop running this script. A script on this page is causing your web browser, browser to run slowly. If it continues to run, your computer might become unresponsible, responsive. And it had uh, a yes and a no response. I clicked on the yes, not knowing what that was going to give me. And um, it uh, gave me another screen then that had red dots running from left to right. Or, or, and uh, it had a capital N 
small a capital N. And it kept running and kept running. I went to church. A couple hours later, I came back. It was still running. So I gave it a King's X. Can anybody tell me what's going on? And it said, uh, a script. How do I find out what script it is? It's very confusing to me. Anybody have an answer to that? I have no clue. Were you on a website? Uh, no, I was just bringing up my computer, well, my laptop. And I have McAfee. It was a McAfee uh, pop-up. Oh, is why you were booting? Yeah, it was. Well, I was booting up the uh, my the screen. computer. Uh, did it? Ha has it happened since then? It happened some time ago, and I just left it go. But I have to say, my my laptop runs very slow. Uh, you were hacked. It runs so slow that I go ahead and restart the thing. But uh, yeah, it's it. It, it sounds like some, twenty minutes to bring it up in the morning. Yeah, it sounds like something is uh, trying to load and it can't, or it's waiting for something else to load and it's not doing it in the right order. That sort of thing. Uh, the best thing uh, to do, my suggestion would be to go into your startup. Uh, a list of startups and turn off as much as you know what it is uh, and turn a lot of it off. And then if it uh, boots quicker, then just add one at a time to see what's either slowing you down or you probably got some things that are loading when you uh, turn on your computer that you don't need running in the background until you really need that program. Does I'm McAfee right have a boots? Does McAfee have a boot scan? where it runs before the op before it loads all the other crap that goes on. It actually does a scan right at boot. I don't uh, know whether that's something that I don't know. <laughs> there is a utility called uh, what crashed. If you download that and install it, and then when you run what crashed, it'll go through your uh, memory dump files and it'll tell you what programs and what uh, instances of those programs caused a, caused a crash. It might be in there if it did crash at all. Well, essentially, it didn't crash. It just uh, it kept running and running and running with these dots, like I said. And I just finally killed well, did it. it. Did it put it? Did it put yeah, anything it on in the memory dump file? Pardon. Did it put anything into a memory dump file? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Okay. Uh, I, I well, guess we gave you a few suggestions anyway. Okay. Uh, Thank ho you for hopefully, hope, hopefully you can find out what caused it. Uh, and, and the slowing down a lot of times it's because we, we keep adding new uh, programs and or apps, and when we do, a lot of them are installing themselves uh, with the ability to, uh, when you start up, they're running in the background, and some of those you might want to just turn off, and that may speed things up. I'll give it a uh, try. Thank you. Okay, Bill, you're next with your hand up. Yes, I was wondering if you uh, have any uh, suggestions after that SD card thing of what runs the fastest. Uh, SD card, uh, USB, and which version of USB in that? You Did you say USB? Yes, because you showed the uh, card reader there, and I know the USB 1 and USB 3. Oh, okay. I see what you're, you're with the uh, adapters. I would say if you can find, a, if you have a USB C, connector on your uh, on your computer and you buy one that has the USB-C connection, it's going to be the fast, that's the, going to be the fastest to, uh, uh, to uh, do the reads and writes. Do they go through all the same uh, alphabet soup as uh, the SD card did? Um, yeah, there, there, there are several, but uh, uh, you know, there's a USB 
three, there's a USB two, and then the original USB. So, uh, and each one's faster than the other. So, uh, uh, yeah, getting the fastest USB connection will do your uh, read writes a lot quicker. Okay, thanks. Unless you already have a USB, uh, a, a, a flash card reader yeah. built into the system. Yeah, if you got if if you've got a card slot in your computer and you may have and not realize it, uh, okay. it may re it may require one of the mini uh, or the micro SD cards. Uh, I've got one of my uh, Chromebook. I have one in in a in my other laptop as well. And uh, you just have to make sure that you don't put one in it bigger than the maximum that it takes. So that would be faster than the USB cord then to actually have one internal. Absolutely. Well, it should be. Uh, although uh, a C might be faster. Ron, your hand is up next. Excuse me. I just wanted to tell you, everyone, about a tech support problem I had with myself this week. It uh, ended up being a simple problem, uh, but but it caused me a lot of grief. I was watching a video, and this particular video was on a Vimeo service, which is like YouTube, and the sound went off, and, and I had no sound. Now, this week, I've made a lot of changes to my system, as you, you may or may not know, but I'm using OBS, which is an open broadcast source, which I'm using to stream out and, and connect to, to Zoom. So I made a lot of technology changes, and I thought that must have been the problem. And it took, I spent all afternoon trying to figure this out. And at the end of the day, it simply ended up that somehow I had muted the tab in my browser. So I just wanted everyone, if you do do tech support, the ability to mute a tab, if you click on the tab in Chrome on the right hand side at the top, you'll see you can mute that tab. And that's all it was. It had nothing to do with all the other changes I did. It just was that tab was mute. As soon as I unmuted it, the music, everything came back and it was fine. So I'm just, if you do tech work, just remember that, that I learned something this week and it would have saved me a lot of hours had I known that. So I thought I'd just let everyone know. And the reason that's there is a lot of people complain at work. If they're looking at something and, and music starts to play, it blasts out and everybody turns right. around and, and, and their boss especially looks. But I, and so, but I, yeah, but I had thought it was, you know, all the changes oh, yeah. and, and all the all the different changes I'd made in technology. It had nothing to do with any of that. You know, like and you probably just... spent a lot of time going back and forth and, oh, and man, checking yeah. in the settings and oh yeah. gosh, yes. None of that. It was just the fact that that tab was muted. So just <laughs> look for I simple feel, things first. <laughs> I feel that frustration for you. Uh, right, the next thanks. person, I can't read uh, their name. It's uh, uh, it's their email address, but. Uh, MZ Stratton. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, that's a problem because uh, some weeks ago when I was uh, signing in for Tech for Seniors, it, something popped up and it seemed like I needed to put my email in, which I'd never had to do before. So that's what I did. And now it comes up with my email instead of my name on it. So how do I change, how do I get rid of that for one thing? And then I have another question after that. Okay, if you click the participants button at the bottom of the Zoom uh, screen and find your name, and then go to, uh, let's see, let me see exactly how you do it. Uh, you go to the three dots, and one of the things there is going to say rename. And you rename you just, and put, put your uh, name back there. Here, Another way is just, just to right, right click, click on your picture. Right click on your picture. And, and that'll give you the rename option as well. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, right. so I, I can just go up in my little block and then right click on that. Correct. And yep. Go that yep. way. All right. Yep. The other question I have on uh, the I live in a townhome association and the neighboring area they were putting in the uh, fiber optic through there and um, the associate someone in the association questioned about it because uh, they wondered if they were going to do it in our area and they were told that they that the association has 
the association has to invite Metronet. And um, I wondered if you have any information about Metronet Internet Service. In I don't. I, I use a service called Frontier, and they have fiber optics, and I have it coming to my home. And uh, and I that gives me very high speed. Uh, I would imagine your association has to okay it because they probably have to put it through the whole building. Yes. I, I, Yes, yeah. that's correct. Yes. Um, I, uh, I, 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 my personal advice would be go for it. It's, it's you know, fiber is good and fast and probably you, your existing system isn't that fast. So go for it, right? Well, it was some question because I, I have cable now uh, through um, Mediacom oh. in my area and it covers the TV, internet and my uh landline phone as well so it, okay. i i didn't know if it would be beneficial or not and there's a lot of questions about it because one person had a comment that they said that it still has a lot of the same issues as our media com so I, it's questionable so thank you very much for your answers okay anybody else uh with a question i guess we're we've used up our time and what we made it through, Ron. <laughs> you did a great job, Huey. Well done. Uh, oh, Huey. absolutely. I want again. Yeah, was there any doubt? Was there any was there any doubt? Uh next month I won't be doing uh, as many uh videos. I just had the two left over from last month, and that and I also wanted to do the one new one for this month. So I'm glad everyone has uh joined us. Uh be sure to uh see us on Thursday for uh, Tech for Senior Live, and don't forget the uh, Windows uh, SIG on Sunday, and back again here next Monday. So with that, uh, thank you all for joining, and we'll see you uh, next time. Bye-bye.